Well, the Chinese government just recently announced that starting in December, control of some of its airspace is going to move from the military to the civilian. And this apparently is going to be a very big step for China. Joining us today on AOPA Live is Jim Fallows, the national correspondent for The Atlantic Magazine, also a Cirrus pilot uh, and the author of the book China Airborne. Jim, thanks for joining us on AOPA Live and, and tell us what this change means. Well, it's actually quite a significant thing. This has been something that for the past 10 years has been in discussion in China. And the larger drama of China is the tension between the traditional security-minded communist, if you will, forces and those who are trying to liberalize the country in various ways, business forces often. And the airspace has been a particularly important axis for this dispute because uh, a huge difference between China and the U.S. is that, you know, of course, the vast majority in the, of airspace in the U.S. is not military, but the vast majority of airspace in China is military. It started out being military controlled. And so the main constraint, not simply on um, airline routes, which are often very indirect because they have to go around uh, military operations, but general aviation and business aviation has been control of the airspace. So the fact that the government is going to allow more airspace for business aviation operations is quite a big thing. So, so sort of explain the difference. I mean, under the military control, it could take hours, if not days, to get approval for a flight, correct? Yes, there's a, there's a combination of factors, all of which have, have um, made it difficult for Chinese GA to develop as fast as the geography of the country and, and its uh, business base w would indicate. One is there's not yet the network of infrastructure that it, we have in the U.S. They're building more airports. About 100 of them are underway now, trying to get fuel distributed. But even more than, than that is the fact that since um, it's essentially most of China is, is run by the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, for the, the airspace. And so you can't go through it at all in some cases. In other cases, it may take uh, days, weeks, a uh, very long time of advanced request. And so the main virtue of general aviation is, of course, it's ad hoc. Um, short notice nature, and if you can't do that, that's made it very difficult for people to uh, there to, to develop the the industry. So, if there's more chance now for the business people in China, both domestic and international, to go from place to place uh, in business aviation, both turbine and piston driven, then suddenly the I think the potential market in China that's been there for quite a while will be able to develop more more rapidly. Well, and China is trying to develop its general aviation industry. I mean, it's, it's part of their five-year plan, as I understand. Yes, it certainly is. There's been a big um, drive in China under the new regime to, set, to try to move the country from its current economic model, which has been successful in bringing peasants into the countryside, but it's, it's brought China only to a certain level of economic development, of having these factories that are essentially subcontractors for the rest of the, the world's um, name brand corporations. So they want to have a world competitive aerospace industry, pharmaceuticals, infotech, and all the rest, but they haven't been able to, to, to develop that uh, domestically. So this is part of the scheme to be able to have a more um, viable a general aviation industry domestically so that they, they can have their own uh, momentum. Of course, uh, Chinese interests have bought, bought Cirrus, the company whose uh, airplane I've flown for a long time, other important aviation interests in the United States. So this is a way to try to have their own domestic market be more, uh, more vital too. But they still have a long ways to go. I mean, I, I think there's what, something like a thousand general aviation aircraft in China right now? Uh, yes, it's uh, you know several orders of magnitude less than the United States. I think that the people in the U.S. we often uh, complain that with some justice uh, the difficulties that GA faces in the U.S. the loss of airports, etc. Compared to the rest of the world, this still is paradise, and especially compared with China, where there are only a couple of hundred airports and only a few thousand airplanes, and so it's you can tell that it's right in the, the cusp of real development. There is still a romance of aviation in many parts of China, sort of like the 1920s must have been in the U.S. of barnstormers and people who are trying to build airplanes in their backyards, and a real pent-up demand because um, in its geography, China is a lot like the United States, where the western parts of it are very mountainous, very remote, very remote. There are long distances and difficult to travel by roads or by airlines. So so much um, development has been going on there that if there were a way for more general aviation to uh, come into, into uh, business there, I think there would be a market for it. 
Uh, Jim, we should mention that you have lived in China and you travel there quite frequently. I think you've just come back from a trip, haven't you? Yes. Uh, 36 hours ago, I was uh, getting on a plane in Beijing. That's why I'm spacey right now. <laughs> I think it's still 3 a.m. Or wherever I am. And, and over this last now seven years, I've spent about four years out of the last seven living in China. And I've used the aviation industry there as sort of a proxy for China's uh, larger development because almost everything that's either successful or limited about China, you can find some aviation um, uh, angle for. And, well, and actually, I wanted to move down that road because uh, freedom of travel is one of the ways that one democratizes the country. So are, are we seeing a, a gradual opening up of China? We're seeing it, um, yes and no. Some of uh, your viewers may have noticed in the last couple of weeks, there's been the so-called third plenum going on in Beijing, which is a weirdo name, which means this uh, every five-year event they're having to try to assess their, their progress. And there were a number of reforms that the new government um, announced, one of which was a somewhat more freedom of movement for migrant workers. So the biggest transportation issue in China is one that doesn't really involve aviation. It's the hundreds of millions of people who whose real residence is out in the countryside someplace but who are working in the big cities on construction projects or some of these low-wage factories. A number of them have been in a kind of twilight zone existence where they don't have a uh, so-called hookah, which is a residence permit, so their kids can't go to school, they can't get health care, things like that. So the government is trying to normalize their situation so they can have a, a better life. At the, the higher end of the transportation spectrum, that's where they're talking about business aviation as being important for the development of their corporate sector. Well, we say freedom of movement is, is important for democratization, also freedom of information, and I don't yes. think the Chinese have made much progress there. Uh, this is a really big issue, and I'll mention two parts of it that I think uh, your viewers, again, may have paid attention to. One is the Internet. I am struck every time I go to China about what a difference it makes the censorship of the internet simply, you can get around it if you're a foreigner, you can buy something called a VPN, a virtual private network for about $40 a year, you can get around the censorship, but it means the internet operates at about one third speed from the rest of the world. And it's just kind of a, a handicap on all high end activities that, that, that happen there. Uh, the other sort of, of uh, control and information is the uh, difficulty that Western journalists are having operating in China, where there's right. more and more it's just hard to get visas to go in there. The paradox there, or sort of the self-inflicted wound, is my argument is that China, with all of its problems, is on balance a, a you know, there are more good things going on there than bad things, even though there are a lot of bad things going on, from pollution to uh, labor problems to all the rest. So if the government simply let more people in, more foreigners, more foreign reporters, I think they would have a better PR image in the West that they kept making it so hard for journalists to come in there. But that is a very different instinct from what the communist government has, has there. In my recent book, um, uh, China Airborne, I was arguing that if China really wants to ascend to the higher levels of industrialization and wealth, then real freedom of movement, freedom of information will be uh, important parts of the arsenal. But I am not in charge of China. <laughs> well, recognizing you're not in charge of China, but now let me have you gaze into your crystal ball. What's China going to be like in 20 years? Uh, that is the fundamental question, because I think one argument, so th there is an argument that I think people used to make that very few people make now, which is that as China got rich, it would simply become like the Western world. I think that people recognize that China has gotten richer in these last 30 years, and it still is not really westernized. So probably the idea of China as a bigger version of Germany or a bigger version of Canada is not really going to happen. There are people who say that China is right on, on the brink of collapse, and they've been saying that for a long time. I think we have to recognize the, governor, the, the government there has been very, very good at recognizing what is the next disaster and avoiding that. So I think the real question is whether China is going to, whether it's going to look back on 2013 as a kind of golden age before pollution really got the worst of it and before it sort of stagnated in its economic growth, or whether, whether it will look back on what we have right now as one more step in its ascent. If it is the latter, if China is going to be able to keep developing, then I think the current government will have to keep liberalizing politically as well as economically.
but nobody on earth knows whether they're going to do that. And that's why it's interesting because you just can't tell what's going to happen next. Okay, Jim, final thoughts on uh, general aviation in China? Well, I, I think that, that, that it's um, a lot of friends I know in aviation are in China now because it is such a potential growth area. And so I think that if, if there are any of your viewers who are thinking that maybe the U.S. market is saturated or Europe too, and they're looking for new adventures, I say, look across the Pacific. They can use your talents, your insight, and your flying skills in China. Jim, once again, thank you very much for joining us on AOPA Live. Always insightful, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Warren.